So I'd like to invite Matthew Rosenquist up here. He's our next speaker. And Matthew is a strategic security planner with Intel, and he's going to be talking to us today about cybersecurity trends, Intel's view. So I know you had a nice segue there with one of the questions that were asked, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? Good. Matthew Rosenquist. I'm a security strategist at Intel. So very, very passionate about security. A pleasure to be here and talk with you today. Question for you. Who here, by show of hands, loves security? Loves it. Absolutely loves it. Liars. Each and every one of you. I love you guys. Who thinks it's the bane of their existence? It is a pain. It is an enigma. It is a just, you know, a sucking sound for resources and attention. All right, all right. I'm in the right route. I'm in the right place here. What I want to talk to you today about is, you know, why we're here, what we're doing uh, in security, and you know, hopefully be able to, to answer some questions. Love my lawyers, so we're, we're going to skip over that. <laughs> don't tell them, don't tell them. So we'll talk a little bit about, and, and John did a great job in talking about the industry, and we all know security is tough, it's a pain. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit about cybersecurity, some of the challenges that we all deal with, what we're dealing with today, and kind of where it's going. Um, defense in depth strategy, some layered security, some of the best practices that we've seen, we actively go out uh, and talk with, uh, with companies. We get pulled in and we provide our insights. We've been doing security. I've been doing security for about 20 years now. And a little background on who I am. Uh, I started really on the operations side. I justified and built Intel's first 24 by 7 security operations center. I was the first incident commander for Intel. So anytime there was an attack, it was me and my team that took over the company and decided what we were going to do. I managed all security for all of our mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, site closures, and co-locations worldwide. All aspects of security. Right. I've been there, been around the block a few times. I've got the scars. Intel now pays me right, to look into the future and figure out what can we do from a technology space, from a process space. Where is cybersecurity going? Right. How can we potentially get ahead or at least tread water. Because as John said, it's, it's not getting any easier. We all know that. You're here for a reason. I'm sure it's not for the free coffee. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And I've got some discussions about where kind of we see the innovation going. And I'll talk about some of the endpoint changes that we're seeing in the industry. Okay. Now I assume some of you have questions in your mind. Right. The executives of any organization are normally perplexed with all sorts of rattling questions in the back of their mind. Am I doing enough for security? Am I spending too much? Am I not spending enough? Am I managing my risk? How am I going to stay in compliance with regulations? Right, all those kind of things. You're not the only ones. And I guarantee everybody's thinking about those things, or you should be. So I'll see if we can weave some of those topics in. And we'll save some time at the end for questions. If you have a burning question, stop me. All right? This is a nice, tight group. All right? Let's ask the questions. And if not, I'll defer to John. It's great. Coming in first. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about, you know, with John, it's changing. It's not getting easier. We've got a lot of things in the mix. Regulations are spawning up, and unfortunately, they're not consistent all, right? all over the world whether it be privacy or, or for certain uh, business segments, industries. Virtualization, is that really taking root, both on the client and especially in the data center? That throws in a lot of chaos into the mix, which is wonderful. Right? This is why I love security. Private and cloud adoption, or private and public cloud adoption. Again, economies of scale are driving the industry and the world to things like this, but it has severe ramifications for security. That's going to change right, over time. The explosion of the internet, and especially internet of things. Right now, we each, I think the average is, uh, each of us has two point something devices connected to the internet. Within a few years, that'll be 10x. It'll be our refrigerators and cars. I mean, they're forecasting all sorts of stuff. How do we secure that? And they have to inter, um, interconnect and operate. The consumer of, uh, consumerization of IT, and that includes BYOD and whatnot. 
employees want the productivity gains. They want the convenience of connecting, of sharing, and not just a little bit of data, everything. And they want it on their corporate network. And there's some great benefits for it, right? The enterprise benefits when the employees are more productive. So we definitely want to extend that to them. But because it's not homogeneous, it becomes very complex. And how do we, how do we deal with that? The complexity of the IT model, as IT is being forced to develop and provide services internally to the employees, as well as to your customers, your partners, your vendors, your outsourcers, it becomes more problematic. How do you track that? You may have outsourced HR or finance or some application. How do you know that outsourcer hasn't outsourced that? How do you know where your data is and how it's being secured? How do you know if it gets violated, breached, copied, destroyed? Will you know? Are you sure? So all these things start adding up. Now the very last one there is a particular favorite of mine. Because our industry, security, is not single faceted. Right? IT typically is. If you think about the problems that IT normally has, let's say a power supply goes out on my server. Pretty straightforward. I know what I have to do. I've got to go track it down, rip out the power supply, put in a new power supply, and it's done. It's pretty straightforward. It's scriptable. It's easy. Right? Cybersecurity isn't. There's this active attacker, this threat agent is what we call them. And it's not scriptable or as scriptable. They're thinking, and unfortunately, they may be, may be smarter than you. But they will adapt to what you do. It's not that simple. If it were that simple, we would have solved it a long time ago. So it's not just technology. It's living, breathing opponents out there. And it may be inside your network, right? Employees. There could be malicious employees having a bad day, don't like their boss, whatnot. They may do something bad. It may be that employee that's just making a mistake. They're, they're not trying to do anything bad, but it happens. And it could be that pimple-faced hacker or that nation state you know, outside of your firewall that also is, is opposing you. You have to deal with all of these things and the capabilities and access that all of these threats have. And it adds up, especially when you start combining the rest. And you're giving that brand new employee on day one access to the corporate network on their cell phone as they're traveling and moving about. So the challenges we face through the adoption of technology, through accelerating the pace of our services, helping our customers and our business partners, the challenges go up. All right. So from an executive level, right, we try and look at an overview of what we have to do. Executives, really, <laughs> most of the ones I talk to, security gives them a headache, rightfully so. It's not easy, it's not simple. They just, just get it done, just so we're secure, just so we're compliant and whatnot. But really what it is, it's about balance. With infinite resources, you can have infinite possibilities. And if I had infinite resources, could I secure my environment? Sure. Right. I don't know anybody that has it. But we can kind of look at it as a balance. And the way we coined it internally is we're searching for an optimal level of security. And to do that, we have to balance some factors. Number one, cost. Right? Again, we're not going to bankrupt a company to provide security. We're not. There needs to be a certain reasonable amount that we're going to invest to protect from losses. So that is a very, very important anchor. The next, risk and compliance. Risk against loss. The whole reason you invest in security is to reduce, minimize loss. Okay. Security inside of a company is not generating you revenue. It's a cost sink. We know that. So you have to have that, find that balance to make sure that your residual risk, the losses that you are going to experience, and you will, no matter what security you put in place, there will still be some residual loss. That's okay but that that residual loss is acceptable. 
right? especially based on how much you're willing to invest in it. The last of the three areas here is user productivity. You guys, uh, 10, 15 years ago, you remember antivirus on the clients? It would run once a week, if that, right? and it would bog your system down, couldn't really work. You'd set it off to run and go to lunch or set it off and then go home and come back the next day. User productivity is huge. And if you did even have an infinite amount of resources to implement every security control and software out there, you would bog down your employees, your users, and everything else. So we have to find that balance between cost, between the risks of loss, and that end user experience of the people that you're trying to protect who are managing and creating that information that you hold so valuable. Now here's the tricky part. That optimal level is different for every single person in this room, I guarantee it. And to make things more complex, it changes over time. If you haven't had a breach or an outage in a long time, you're going to be thinking, how can I cut costs? On the other hand, if you're getting hammered and your IP is being lost, or your factories are down, or your name is in the news in not such a flattering way, or your customers are mad, you're thinking, all right, I need to ratchet that up. That optimal level of security is now shifting. But this is the challenge from an executive view. Do you have to understand all the nuances? No. More than likely, you've got people on your staffs and whatnot that are working all those details. But from the highest level, the leadership of an organization, they have to realize there is a balance and it's a moving target. And in order to hit that and set the right expectations with the people who are going to provide that balance, you have to support and communicate to them what you want, what you expect. It's a tough enough job for them just to hit it. But as it changes, you have to be that voice. OK, so the second aspect, and again, this is more of the, the, the details. And at an executive level, at a leadership level, you don't need to know those things. It helps if you're interested. And if you're not interested, it's just, you know, your eyes are going to glaze over. But the people who are actually providing the security controls, managing the risks, whether it be through software, business process, or whatnot, they have a very, very complex environment that they have to deal with. Right? Whether it be their networks, whether it be end devices, whether it be um, uh, partners that are connecting in, customers that need to reach in, managing firewalls, whatnot. Right? They have to deal with that and as it changes. And then you throw into this mix those threats. Again, it's not just the guys outside. It's not just the nation states or the hacker down the street. Right? It's also internal. It could be that employee of the year. You just never know. In many cases, it's also management. Again, you don't know. And it could be malicious. Right? The employee who's really mad at their boss for some reason. And they just want to hack into their account and expose these nasty emails that have been going on. If they're good, they only expose the emails from that person. If they're bad, they expose the email for the entire company. So we have to worry about the threats, the trusted users. Every employee, every business partner more than likely has access to your system, to your data. Infrastructure and business process, especially the business process. Right? We'll talk about this actually in the next slide as well. The business process governs a lot of what people do and how they do it. So even if you have the best security from a technology perspective in place, right, you may have weak business processes that still make you vulnerable. So it's not just about patching that server or that client or that cell phone. Right? We have to understand how the data flows, where it goes, how to recover it, how to manage it through its life cycle. And lastly, the data itself, right? Every organization has a tremendous amount of data, and over the years, that goes up. How many people here manage that data through its life cycle? I see one. That's good. Right? Data over time becomes caustic. 
right? How many emails, how many IMs, how many conversations, how many documents are out there on servers that you don't know? How many of you shipped off to your partners and vendors and whatnot and really hope that they've taken care of them as well? So the security folks who are actually working in this world, they understand the nuances. At a leadership level, it's simply important to understand that we have to all address this, and they're going to. If you set the expectations up at the top, they can start applying security in these spaces. They have to. All right, going back to that business process, one of the things we use at Intel is a defense in depth methodology. And this is really about the business process. We look at security as a series of dials, capabilities that we have to have in place. And these capabilities, these dials can be turned depending on what the optimal level of risk is. We have this capability at an enterprise level. We may have it down to a business level. We may have it down to an individual data center or even a series of files or systems. But the way we look at it really is in four areas. When we try and manage risk, and again, it's for all those things that we saw in the previous slides, all those complexities. First off, predictive, right? Prediction. You want to be able to understand who's coming after you, because if you do, you probably have a better understanding how they're going to attack you. Now, there are a tremendous number of vulnerabilities out there. And in most cases, most of them are never used. Why? Attackers are lazy. I love them. They follow the path of least resistance. So understanding who that threat agent is, understanding where most likely you're going to be attacked and how, gives you the insights. Because even in my organization, right, there is no way to squash every single vulnerability. I have over 100,000 users scattered all over the world. I have 26 different operating systems in my factories alone. Thousands of applications. The challenge is not, or the goal is not, to squash every single vulnerability. I know that can't happen. Instead, I have to be able to prioritize my resources. Prediction gives us that capability. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But do we effort it? Yes, we do. We have teams at Intel that work on this all the time to understand where we are, where we need to be, how we need to shift resources. And I saw a question come up. Yes? Yeah, on the cloud, if somebody's doing IP masking, how are you going to know? Because that corresponds to their address changes IP address all the time. You cannot track the person. Absolutely. We're not ta talking tracking individuals. We're talking tracking um, threat agent classes. So think of a threat agent class as an internal thief. That might be one class, right? An employee, and it could be anywhere in the company, but they have access. Right? For that type of threat, I know that their objective is probably financial gain. So there are certain paths of least resistance that they're going to go to. They're going to use the access I give them or someone nearby. Right? And so I can start tracking that, right? start looking at that and determining what's the risk there, what are the controls, both technical and behavioral, that I need to put in place. Is it something that I want to take care of in prevention or is it something that I want to do with prediction and response? And we'll kind of get there and, and talk about that. Okay. So it's not identifying a, an individual threat agent. It is a class. The next one is prevention. Right? If you have a good understanding of your environment, of who's coming after you, and the methods that they're using, and what they want to accomplish, now you can get into something that's very, very cost effective. If you can prevent it, it saves you so much time, money, effort, pain, and sorrow. It's great, right? You can put in technical controls, you can put in behavioral controls, you can modify business processes. There's many different options that you can do. If we keep going in, down through the cycle, we hit detection. Now, I would love to be able to prevent every single type of loss, and I'm sure you would as well, right? It's very economical. It's very nice to get ahead of the game. It doesn't always happen. You'd be, we'd all be lying to ourselves if we think it did. So we have to have detection mechanisms to understand when our preventative 
controls miss something. Because if we don't, whatever gets through will run amok. And you may never know it. You may be bleeding IP for years and not know it. Right? So we have to have detection controls. Now, traditional <laughs> cybersecurity has always been you have to have 100% prevention. You have to prevent everything. That's where you throw all your resources. And that becomes a challenge, especially when we get into black swan type of events, where something might happen. If it does, it's a real big impact. But it would be a rarity. It's that one in a million kind of event. And to try and protect against many of those one in a million kinds of event is real expensive. So do you invest? Do you spend the millions of dollars to protect against an event that probably will never happen? What do you do? This is where the dials start to come in. Instead of trying to prevent that bad thing from happening, instead, you can put in a, det a detective control to be able to pick it up quickly if it does, and then rapid response to be able to minimize the, the loss. Right? We do this all the time. It's a trade-off that is allowable. In fact, it's smart. This is how we internally and our business partners and, and other you know, organizations we consult with, this is what they use as well. It gives you another option. You don't always have to prevent it. And those technical folks, a lot of the people running the firewalls and managing client security and whatnot, they don't think in these terms many times. Their job, looking forward, I have to prevent everything. In many cases, that's not the most economical path. So we have options. The last one is response. Whether it's responding to incidents, small or large, whether it's warm backups, whether it's, there are many different capabilities. At Intel, we have a team that is dedicated any time the company is attacked. Right? And when that red button is hit and this team activates, they have a tremendous amount of latitude and control to go resolve the issues. So we align our response capabilities with all of these things. And once they understand what's going on, that just simply feeds the intelligence back into the prediction. One of the best metrics you can have to predict, predict what's going to happen to you is real events that actually happen to you. If they happen to you once, they're probably going to happen to you again. Right? So it feeds this continuous cycle of improvement. We see that business process of security as being very, very important. And what we address here is not only on the technical side. You know, we can talk about cloud and VPN and firewall settings and ports and you know, the latest patches and technologies. That's only half of the cyber security coin. The other half is the wetware, right? the users. I can put in all the technical security controls I want but I'm still going to have users clicking on links. I am. I'm still going to have them print out the documents and leave them on the table as they walk out. How do I control all of that? Well, for us, we actually train our employees. I would rather have a community of security savvy employees than a stack of firewalls. Right? You need both. But we can't underestimate that other side of the coin. Yes, question. Rami Sephora from Comcast. So one of the things I see missing in the, in the picture here, uh, especially when we call it uh, in terms of cybersecurity strategy, is the regulations, mm. the forthcoming regulations. And I really see that as the fifth pillar of this picture because, you know, to some extent we can control that, mm -hmm. but honestly it's got a life of its own and sometimes I feel like the industry is almost catching up and we should be on the front line of that instead of catching up to that legislations and some of the regulations that's coming our way. So I'm interested to see how you preparing yourself yes. for the forthcoming It's an excellent question. So around the regulations, and I don't want to phrase this improperly here, my lawyers are going to kill me. Um, <laughs> we look at that as a predictive situation. We look at the legislation that's being proposed in different countries around the world that we operate in, which is just about all of them, 
right, to understand, and we have an entire legal and regulatory team that looks at this, to see what's going to be likely enacted. How would we have to change? And that feeds into preventative controls to make sure that we align to that. And when we do it right, we align in advance. So it isn't a huge disruption to our operations because they are very, very complex and one little change can have a cascade effect. So we need that time. If we don't predict that, right, we won't have the time to change in all what, I've got 18 factories and assembly test sites and research and development and marketing and sales. Again, those 100,000 people all around the world, some of them with very, very delicate systems. We have to have that. So we actually look at it as part of the prediction aspects so that we can get things ready and prepare for it. Okay, it's a great question. Yes? And Mark Kader from Aetna. Um, if you add a fifth, if you add that compliance thing as a fifth area, this also represents, in my experience, kind of a talent framework, which mm -hmm. it's occurred to me over the years that people, you know, in security or just like anything, it's, there's different people for, are wired to do different things yes. well and enjoy doing different things. And they tend to fall in those camps as well. There's people that love to do predictive modeling. And then there's people that are more engineering oriented that think that's a bunch of you know mystery, <laughs> mysterious <laughs> stuff and <laughs> I'd rather go build something. Right, and the engineers, frankly, right, oh, and, I love them. Yeah, and then the engineers are very different than the people who are convinced that whatever the engineers do is flawed. You know, and those are the detective people. The, the QA right? people, yes, yeah. yes. And <laughs> or, your, or your security intelligence people or mm -hmm. your SOC people. Um, and then the response people. It's, if you add the compliance in there, it's, those are the five camps of security talent that I've seen people kind of fall into. And some people can do more than one, yep. but they can't do more than like three. So It's a rarity to, to yeah. find people that can kind of bridge that mindset. Yeah. It is difficult. So it's it important difficult. to match your talent to the. Yes, to it is. And you know, even when you talk about the regulatory stuff, it bridges a lot of these, yeah. right? So you've got regulatory things in the technology space. Uh, you know, you've got regulations for healthcare devices, for example, where you're going to the engineers and saying, hey, as a mandate, you need to be able to have these functions and whatnot. You have other ones, uh, privacy, for example, a little more squishy right? and varies across the world. Right? You need the, the policy people to figure out what is that high watermark because I don't, you know, my devices can go all over the place. What is the high water mark? Go up a little higher and then make it happen within the company. So yes, very good. So the next one that I wanna talk about is really about a layered defense. We talked about the business process. Now we're gonna flip back over kind of into the technology side. And again, I've got a, I have the pleasure of talking with a lot of different companies out there and I enjoy, uh, you know, bantering back and forth to figure out what really is needed. Uh, I go to some companies and they think, oh, well, we've got anti-malware on our PCs and servers, we're good. I've got other people that go, oh, no, 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 I've got uh, network controls, we're good. The reality is where we see the threats, the complexities, everything we talked about earlier, right? path of least resistance. If you only have security controls on the client, where's the bad guy going to attack? If you only have controls on files and data, where are they gonna go to? And again, remember that two-sided coin, even if you're bulletproof in here, where are they gonna go to? Your employees. I'm gonna spam them, I'm gonna fish them, I'm gonna call them on the phone and ask them their password, which works great still, right, in a lot of companies and a lot of organizations. It's the weak link that they're going for. Where we see security playing is in all these spaces. They have to. If the software isn't hardened well and the platform isn't hardened well and the network doesn't have the right controls, you have a weak spot. Now in many cases, if you do have some of those, you might be good for the casual attacker. Right? Many attackers just go after anybody who is vulnerable, easily vulnerable, and they go for those. The dedicated attacks, the ones that are targeting your organization, your employees or your data, they will look for the weak spot. So again, understanding who's attacking you and why helps in managing where you want to put those resources. So we'll talk about that. All right, so I'm going to jump uh, topics here a little bit and talk about at Intel kind of what we're looking at, uh, putting my hat on, Right, in the next few years, what we see down the road. 
And at Intel, it definitely benefits us to make sure the entire computer eco ecosystem around the world is more secure, right? It helps, well, it helps our business, but it helps everybody communicate, get connected, right? Run their businesses. We want to see that. We are very strong advocates of security around the world, and that's one of the reasons that I get to go to companies such as yours and just sit down and, and help out and, and provide resources sometimes. There's a question? Yes. If you're currently working with McAfee and other model ones, why not put a chip on your motherboard itself? And we do put chips on motherboards, yes. <laughs> the security chips the same and work as a collaboration. This way, companies, when they buy enterprise edition of whatever your device uh -huh. is, that basically they get one more layer right there before even purchasing all the other software or whatever other application. Is there anything in the, in the process that you work with collaboration with Absolutely. We spent uh, um, some, invested very well and bought McAfee as well as other companies, right? Including Stone, Stone, Stonesoft. Uh, we're trying to work in all of those spaces. Unfortunately, because the world is not heterogeneous uh, or homogeneous, it's heterogeneous. We have all these different types of applications and operating systems which expect and use things in different ways. So it's not as easy as simply making one piece of silicon that will provide security to everybody. It doesn't quite work that way. Now, that doesn't mean that our brilliant engineers and we're the best engineers in the world aren't thinking in those terms. We are. In fact, I'll show you an example of, of what we're looking at. To his point, though, yes. I think we've already seen this. In oh, the yes. latest version of SE Android and what Samsung is doing. This is Christine Kincaid from Citigroup. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing a trusted platform module be engaged at the hardware level with the operating system when you choose to enable and enforce the SE Android. And they're burning the chipset so that it's one way. So after that point forward, it only will take kernel upgrades and firmware upgrades that are signed by a particular signature from Samsung. I'm surprised at mm -hmm. this point that we're not seeing it in the chipset world from a partnership between operating system providers for the server market. You are seeing it, or you will be seeing it. How about that? So, you know, and what you're talking about provides additional layers of security, right? TPMs have been around for a long time, right? It's, it, it's nothing new in that space. Well, a TPM that isn't trusted is not really a, a good TPM. <laughs> we are seeing the integration, right? And, and I'll go through this slide a little bit. Actually, take a look at it. We're seeing a lot of those attacks. They started out at the top, and I will get to your question here. You know going after the weakest possible link. If I'm a hacker, if I'm a bad guy, again, path of least resistance, the applications tend to be the easiest to hack, right? For all the reasons that John talked about, right? The shrinking of trying to get it out to market, the inconsistency in regarding testing it and, and whatnot, um, some of the underlying components that they bake in and there's vulnerabilities in those. We also see attacks starting to go over the years, starting targeting the operating systems. Right? That's why Microsoft Right, and, and other operating systems are constantly patching. They find those vulnerabilities and they close them. Every Tuesday is a great day, right, if you're running Windows. Over the next few years, and we're even starting to see this now, we're seeing attacks into the virtual machines and even down into the silicon themselves. Right. And it's not easy. It gets progressively harder, probably exponentially harder. But that doesn't dissuade especially well-resourced, well-funded, highly technical attackers and researchers as well. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? The more we understand those and they become public, the more we can fix them, the better we can improve our processes and generation over generation increases. So that's great. But over the next few years, we see more and more going down this stack, which is a problem because when you're up at the top, things like anti-malware software, and what, they do a pretty good job. As you start getting into the operating system, it's a little more difficult right, to identify problems and resolve them, especially as they're constantly changing. Virtual machines, <laughs> now you're starting to get into the Wild West, right, of being able to, to identify problems in virtual machines, especially as they're shifting, like in a cloud environment um, or within a data center that's you know, pushing workloads dynamically across different machines. And in the hardware, when you're below the operating system, it's very difficult. And that's where the trusted TPM that you were talking about, and even things like uh, UEFI, 
right? Where the, when the operating system starts, it's kicking off the anti-malware stuff first. It's validating that you've got some, some controls in there so it hasn't been updated or maliciously hacked, things of that sort. So there is more that's coming. And I want to give you some examples here. The first one is actually an innovation that, uh, uh, with McAfee that we started. So security below the OS. And again, kind of like on the previous slide, we've got the application, we've got the operating system, we've got hardware and firmware below that. What we did with McAfee is we worked on a, we called it a safe products, deep safe, deep defender products. And basically what we do is we create a layer underneath the operating system that's looking at the calls and the information going from the operating system and applications down into the hardware. And because we have this ability to look right where we couldn't look before, we have the opportunity to see malware and attacks that are occurring below the operating system. Something very difficult to do because most malware software works at the software layer. So they're competing with the malware at that software layer or malware ben uh, beneath it in the operating system. This gives us an advantage we didn't have before. We've been testing this. I think actually McAfee shipped it uh, this year, beginning of this year. Right? And we're able to see malware that other software cannot pick up. We're going to see more of this because do you trust your apps? Do you trust your operating systems? Do you trust your VMs? Again, we're trying to stay one step ahead of those attackers. They're moving down, we're moving down. We have to. If we don't innovate, we'll be left behind. Another thing that we're doing you know, in the, in, on the client space is putting in fundamental structures to help security. Right? Encryption is one of those things. Right? We've got encryption standards, algorithms. As we bake those into the silicon, we can have a much better performance level. What does this translate to? Better user experience. Again, it goes back to that triangle that we talked about er earlier. There's cost, there's risk, there's user experience. If I throw on my, my business clients for my employees a security you know, function or software that drags them to their knees and they can't get their work done, it's gone. They won't use it, they'll turn it off. My brilliant engineers will find a way to disable it, which they are very good at. Right. So again, if we can put in things that make the end user experience more tolerable, that allows us to put more security onto the systems, make things go faster. Right. And then the applications and everything below that can also make that happen. So you know, we see this, and it's not just us. Right. It's, all sorts, it's all sorts of silicon providers. Uh, also device providers, right? the hardware uh, for hard drives. You see a lot of that now being embedded with different uh, encryption standards to make it perform much, much faster. The third one is really around data centers. Right? There's a lot of activity in there and there's a lot of potential economic gains in the data center right now, moving to virtualization, moving to cloud. And that's great from a bottom line perspective. It saves you dollars, it makes things go faster, it allows you to expand uh, much easier but it introduces security risks, right? many of which the world hasn't quite understood yet and come to grasp yet. So we're working again to understand and help with the virtualization. To, if you've got a virtualized workload and it's jumping from machine to machine for optimal performance, how do you know those machines are secure? Is it okay to take sensitive data that's working in a virtualized container and move it to the next server? Right, so we're looking at that, we're working with McAfee as well to be able to manage that so that you can get the scale, the efficiencies, the gain by st and still have the confidence of security. It's still in its infancy though. Right? This is not solving the problem, this is taking that next logical step. We're also looking at from a, um, a you know, manageability perspective, we want to be able to reach out and touch systems bring them back up if they are having problems or their BIOS is corrupted or hacked, we want to be able to very quickly have a response capability. I don't want to have to send a technician right, into my data center, have him track down a rack and have to uh, you know, resolve something. It takes too much time, it costs too much money. So instead, if I can do it remotely, connect to that device in a side channel, 
even if it's dead, even the, the BIOS is corrupted and it won't boot, I can connect to it with new technologies, reinstall the BIOS, reinstall the operating system, reimage the device and have it up and running from a technician halfway around the world if I need to. The last thing is hardware enhanced authentication. How many of you have one of those little fobs that have the rotating numbers every 30 seconds and you have to type it in? Yeah, if you don't you love carrying that around? Isn't it great when the battery dies? Uh, it, you know, it's a pain. <laughs> We've been working and we did this back in 2012 where we actually embedded that technology in the device. Is it revolutionary and world changing? No, but it's more convenient goes back to the end user experience, makes things more secure, and if we have to reset all those things, we can do it down the wire, right? Your service vendor can do it, so they don't have to FedEx you a new device with a new battery, right? We can do it down the wire. The other thing we're doing, we're working with some vendors out there to recognize the device itself, so when you connect via VPN, how many people love remembering their password and every, uh, it's a pain. We can use the device, a secure component on the device to identify it and use that as a second factor to log in if need be. Okay. And our employees, we've been piloting this internally, they absolutely love it because you don't have to type in that password. You don't have to remember that strong password. They love it. Okay. And again, part of security is making things easier and faster. All right, summary slide here. So well thought out cybersecurity strategy, right? We have to secure our assets, operations, reputation, competitiveness. We know it's tough, right? We have to set the tone and the expectation. The leadership of the organization has to do it and understand that it is complex, right? But we can address certain areas. We can set the expectation. We know the target is a moving one. We're not putting all our eggs in a basket of, okay, we're just gonna prevent or close every single vulnerability. We have to have a balanced capability to be able to predict, prevent, detect, and respond. And this is how we, we've been operating our company successfully. And we've been working with other companies as well. Uh, the last thing here, uh, someone asked me the other day, hey, you know, what is your single snippet best piece of advice? Right, what's that fortune cookie advice? If you could pass on one thing. Pretty simple, right? Security at its most fundamental is pretty basic. Two types of vic uh, victims exist, right? Those with something of value and those who are easy targets. So protect your valuables and don't be that easy target. Right? Make sure you've got at least best in class in what you're putting out there. Make sure you've got it covered from a comprehensive perspective. Right, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah, question. Right. Right, so we, we're talking lands and lands, right? I'm sorry, what? Oh, what lands and lands. Yes, lands and lands. Lands, lands, mans, sure. How do we, uh, um, when do we get our, our ISPs uh, to, to, to regulate and protect us a little bit more than they're doing right now? Our Verizons, our AT&Ts, and, and so on. You want the ISPs to regulate or, or help you in managing the risk of the networks. Over the wide your network. There's many services out there that can help you know, provide that. Um, we're seeing some changes in those industries to help you know, with the tools and the filtering. There's other services for denial of service when you get attacked for those things to be able to offload and, and track things down and help you out. Um, but again, the attackers will evolve. Right? There are resources available to you. Many of them you know, are going to impact your budgets some of the people in your organization may want to take care of it internally. That's, that's a judgment value based on the available technologies and what you're experiencing. If you're experiencing severe denial of service attacks, you probably want to work with those ISVs and a third party to figure out, all right, how can I resolve this? So there are tools and services available to you, but it depends on your organization and what you need most. Any other questions? Any other questions? Oh, one over here, come on over to you. You introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Mahadi Headley. I'm with uh, Enrivo Corp. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, next generation firewalls? Uh, it's an emerging landscape, and there are some trade offs versus 
uh, traditional unified threat management platforms. Okay. Uh, I'm not here to sell you anything today, by the way. Firewalls over the years have, have evolved, right? What we're calling next generation firewall is not the last generation firewall. But it is the technology that's necessary to be able to um, meet the evolving needs and the threats. If you're running a firewall that's 10 years old, uh, you're probably not running. The attackers, those threat agents, those living, breathing bad guys out there are working with each other. They're developing tools and software and capabilities. They're leveraging resources and cloud resources out there to be able to do what they want to do. They have an objective and they're going to go after it. If you don't have good protections, you're going to start losing that battle and you'll feel it. You may not notice it in the beginning because they want to be stealthy, but you'll feel it. If you don't keep up with the Joneses, as it were, right, you become that easy target. If everyone else steps forward and you're left behind, you're the easy target. Don't be left behind. Right? It's like the, the story with the bear, you know? Two people walking in the woods, bear chases them. Right? You don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun the guy next to you. Right? Other questions? All right, thank you for your time. Thank you, Matthew, that was wonderful. <laughs> Very insightful.